And it is my pleasure this morning to introduce some new missionaries for Cross Point Church. You guys excited about that? We have the Lears family with us this morning. So Jacob, Teresa, you come up. Jacob, Teresa, and they just have a few kids. Their oldest is Josiah and then Isaiah. How about Elijah is in there? Evelyn and then Rosalind. Come on up, guys. Right here. How you guys doing? You guys doing good? These guys are our new missionaries. We've been working with them for the past year, and they work with Youth with a Mission. And they have been in Colorado Springs, but they are heading out to go to the country of Djibouti. Now, how many guys honestly know where Djibouti is without looking at the map? Anybody? It's in Africa. So it's right. They'll put it up there in just a second. But they're heading out. They have a heart for the Somali people. Amen? Amen. And they are passionate about reaching. One of the things I'm so excited about, Jacob and Teresa, they are going to the places where Somali people have not heard about the name of Jesus. And it's a hard place to go. And they're willing to take their kids, their family, and they're willing to go and put their lives on the line to share about Jesus. And I'm so excited. We are so excited as Cross Point Church. So I want to invite the elders, if you guys could come up, and the missions committee. We are going to lay hands on them, commission them this morning as Cross Points missionaries. And they're going to be heading out in... February 25th. So they're going to be having to, we are going to be standing behind them and praying for them, and we're going to be giving to them as well. So if you guys would like to pray with me, please do continue. So Father, I just pray this morning for Jacob and Teresa and their family, Lord, that we commission them as a family, Lord, that you call them to go and share your name to the ends of the earth, Lord. But Father, I thank you for the heart for the Somali people, Lord. That's just been a burden on his heart, Lord. And Father, as he heads to Djibouti, Lord Jesus, as they engage in, with the business, as they engage in teaching English, as they dis- engage in planting churches and discipling uh, many men and women, Lord Jesus, that they would be peacemakers in this country, Lord, that they would bring your love, Lord Jesus, into this dark place. In Jesus' name. You know, we were praying for uh, Jacob and Teresa the other night at the elders meeting, and there was a picture during the uh, prayer of, well, first, he was sharing how things were going really fast, and the Holy Spirit was really moving, and and, uh, things were just crazy, so to speak, but we sensed that that was the move of the Holy Spirit in a mighty way, and as we were praying, the prayer was, uh, as he hops out of the boat, as his family hops out of the boat, things will begin to happen and uh, the waves will flap against him and, and there will be times where he's sinking. He will feel like it, but yet he really won't be because Jesus will be there and he'll reach out and pull him up. And so we pray that prayer over this family that as uh, the Holy Spirit moves, as uh, things get really crazy because the Holy Spirit does amazing things, uh, that Jesus will be there to reach out. As I was praying for your family uh, earlier this morning, I, I just, uh, the Lord just quickened to my heart the, the charge that God gave to Joshua uh, just after Moses had died. And uh, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, <clears throat> I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. And then he talks about the area that Joshua would take. And then in verse 5, it says, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers and give, to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which, my Mo- which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. And this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. So, Lord, I just pray for this family, God, that every place that their foot treads, you have given it to them. And, Lord, as that they walk around and as they pray 
for the people and for the land that they're bringing the gospel, the good news to. Lord, that you would be with them. Lord, that they would be strong and courageous. And that as they meditate on your word, they would know how to communicate that word to the people they're ministering to. And Father, that you will use the children as well as the parents. Not only we're asking for you to protect the children, but use them to reach other children. Father God, your grace to flow through them. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just ask that uh, your countenance would be on their countenances, Lord, as they go and wherever they are each day, uh, that uh, your face would shine through them, your love would shine through them, your mercy and your grace would be in them and from them, Lord. In Jesus' name. You just stretch forth your hands, and uh, I want you to choose either one of the kids or Jacob or his wife, and um, i like you to commit to pray for them at least once this week. Can you do that? Just once this week, pray for them. They're in the middle of a transition. They're going to be leaving, and as a church, this is significant because we're sending them out. It's another church. Obviously, they're connected with another church as well, but we're sending them out as a church, as a local body of Christ to go and to spread the good news. So I want to pray a blessing over them, and I want you to join with me in that blessing, okay? Father, we bless the Lear's family, that you would empower them by your presence, that you would go before them, that you would go behind them, and that you would be beside them. Lord, I pray for these kids, Jesus, that as they're on the field, they themselves would experience your purpose and your power, and your peace, and that you would use them even in their fun times and their joyful times. Uh, Lord, when they're up and they're down, use them to connect to people for your kingdom's sake. Lord, be with uh, Jacob, I pray, that he would have your anointing and your purpose and your calling to lead his family, Lord, in the paths that you have for him. Give them great favor, I pray, in the name of Jesus. God, we believe you're going to do great things in Djibouti, among the Somali people, Lord, among the Islamic realm. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that your power would go with them and that you would anoint them, oh God. Give them divine appointments, Lord, so that they, God, would carry forth your great good news with power, and God, we would see a church established, Lord, all throughout that region, in Jesus' name, and if the church agrees with that, say amen. amen. Let's give them a great big hand. Thank you, guys. Isn't that exciting? We have some new missionaries. You guys ready to hear the word of God? Man, I get excited about that. Of course, uh, many of you know I was a former missions pastor for 18 years, and uh, man, it is so, so very awesome uh, to be able to send out uh, new missionaries uh, into um, places that, man, we wouldn't have even uh, maybe dreamed about years ago, and now God has uh, blessed us to be able to send out some missionaries, and we have more to come, which is even more exciting, so how cool is that? Uh, let's, um, let's, how many of you are ready to hear from God this morning? You came in the snow and, uh, you made it out here. It's cold outside, but it's warm in here. Uh, I think there's something significant to having a heart that says, I'm ready to hear what God wants to speak. And it's one thing to come and just sit. But it's another to say, okay, I'm ready to hear not just what I'm saying, but what the Holy Spirit 
wants to speak. And, and there may be many of you here uh, that have been believers for a long time and your ears are tuned uh, to what God might be speaking, but there may be visitors here or maybe you, you're not really new to the church thing. Uh, God wants to speak to you, and so I'm going to pray uh, that God would open up all of our ears and that he would speak to us. Um, but if you really want God to speak to you, just lift up your hand as I pray over you that we would hear God today. Lord, I pray for this church that they would hear your voice today, not my voice, but your voice, God, that you would quicken hearts and quicken lives, in Jesus' name I pray, and if you agree with that and you want it, say amen, amen. amen. So a few years ago, this goes back several years now, there was a cosmetic company, and uh, they decided they wanted to do a contest where they wanted to find uh, one of the most beautiful women in the country. And so they asked people all over the states to send in a picture of a woman that they thought was beautiful. One in which um, you would look and automatically understand and know that this person was beautiful. And so thousands of letters and pictures came in because they not only wanted to have a picture of who this woman was, but a letter to go along with it kind of describing who this person was. And so one photo and one letter caught the attention of this big cosmetic company, and it was sent from this little boy. And the little boy sent in uh, this photo and this letter, and the president of the company was a little bit taken back. They found that in the letter, the boy wrote that he was from a broken home, and he was living with his dad in a rundown part of town. And he, uh, his mom wasn't around, he didn't have anybody that he was really connecting with, and at school, he was having issues. But there was one bright spot in his life to which he was writing this letter about the most beautiful woman in the world to him. And so writing about this letter, uh, he said this. He said, there's a beautiful woman that lives down the street from me. We meet almost every single day, and she makes me feel like the most important person in the world. She plays games with me. She talks to me. She interacts with me. She understands me, and she listens to my problems. And whenever I leave the house, she yells out at me, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Well, enclosed with the letter was the picture of the lady. She was toothless, smiling, well advanced in years, gray hair put up in a bun, wrinkles on her face, but a little twinkle in her eye, to which the president of this cosmetic company said, we can't use this entry. It would show the world that our products aren't necessary to be beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Because each one of you can be beautiful. Every single one of you, no matter what you look like, no matter where you've come from, no matter what you've done, God wants you to be beautiful. How many of you know beautiful people in your life? How many of you know that when you walk into a certain room with a certain person that's there, you just know that beauty exudes out of them, that they're just kind, that they always bring you up, they don't put you down, they always kind of make you seem like you're the most important person in the world. Well, today I want to challenge each one of us that we would be beautiful Christian people, that we would be beautiful people in the world's eyes, that I would almost say it like this, I want to challenge us to be kind people, because kindness is love in action. Kindness is love in action, and it's beautiful. This is what God has called us to. So all month long in January, we've talked about this. We've talked about reaching up. Pastor Nick last week shared a great message about having dirty hands, that as we lift these dirty hands up, they become holy hands to God. 
And we've talked about getting closer to the Lord and drawing near to Him all through the month of January. And we had this time of prayer and consecration. And now we're going to shift gears just a little bit. And we're going to talk about this idea of reaching in. But it's not just reaching in in terms of looking inside your own self. No, I want us to reach in as a church that we would begin to be kind to one another. And I'm not even talking about the outside world. As, as good and as important as that is, there's something significant about being kind to one another, to those that are what the Bible says of the household of faith. For those of you that are believers, God's called each one of us to be kind to each other. And I was thinking of this um, the story in the Old Testament and uh, you guys are, I'm sure, very familiar with David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan, of course, you know David, King David. He was this young boy, 16, 17 years old. And by the power of God, he kills this giant, Goliath, with a slingshot by the power of the Holy Spirit. And instantly, David's world is transformed. In a moment, he's taken from the hills of Judea, and he's taken into the palace, into the palace. And now he's living with royalty. He's no longer barely getting by. He's now feasting at the king's table. Well, the king, Saul, at that particular time, uh, he has a son named Jonathan. And Jonathan and David become best friends, BFFs, best friends forever, so to speak. And they love each other so much that they enter into what the Bible calls a covenant they, they enter into this relationship whereby they agree to this, that they will stand by each other all the days of their life. And not only their life, but the lives of their kids and their children. And that it was an enduring covenant between David and Jonathan. And if you understand the story, you realize David is no one and nothing. He's just a simple shepherd boy. And Jonathan is the son of the king. He's the heir to royalty. He's going to be the next king. And yet Jonathan, it says, makes the covenant with David. Jonathan so loved David and believed in David that he wanted to have this connection and this covenant that he would be loyal to him for the rest of his life. Well, in the course of events, of course, we know that David and Saul become enemies. David goes out and he becomes famous among his own people. And he slays thousands and thousands of people uh, in battle. And the girls start singing about him. And of course, many of you in the church world, you understand this. Uh, the girls sing, uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And as a result of that, Saul gets jealous. So much so that he begins to plot to kill David. And David now is on the run, which now puts Jonathan and David at real odds. Because here's the son of the king, the heir to the throne, who's made a covenant with David, who now Saul's uh, trying to kill David. And now there's this conflict that takes place. What is Jonathan going to do? How is he going to respond? How is he going to interact with David now? Well, David and Jonathan come together and they agree that they are going to stand by each other, but they have to part ways. And in a sense, in a really sad moment in Scripture, they part ways. They still have heart affection for one another, but Scripture doesn't really make it real clear, but we think that probably they never saw each other for probably more than 10 or 15 years until David, one day after he's been on the run for years and years, he hears that Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle. One of his closest friends, whom he's had covenant relationship with, is now slain on the battlefield. And now this puts David in a really precarious situation. So I'm setting the story for you today. As David then begins to take over the kingdom, David now finds himself as king of all of Israel. And God strengthens him in battle and strengthens his kingdom. And this is where we find the story as we're going to pick it up today uh, in 2 Samuel verse 9. David is now the man in charge 
And this is what David says in 2 Samuel 9. He says, one day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And so he summoned a man named Ziba who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba, the king asked? Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show kindness to them, Ziba replied. Yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive, but he's crippled in both feet. So here's David. He's the king. He's the man in charge. He's seated on the throne. And for a king to sit on the throne, to be in conflict with the previous king, most kings would have obliterated the family of the previous king so that no one else would have right to the throne. But David does something very significant. He said, is there anyone left? He's not searching for Saul's family in order to kill them. He's searching for Saul's family in order to bless them, in order to be kind to them. He seeks out someone to be kind to. Is there anyone left that I can be kind to? And Ziba responds, well, yes, there is. As a matter of fact, Jonathan's son but he's crippled in both feet. And so David then responds. He says, well, where is he? I want to find him. Please tell me where he is. And Ziba says this. He says, he's in Lodabar. He's in this no place, forsaken city. And scholars say this. He was in an forsaken city in order to run away to hide because he was fearful and scared that David would have him killed. Lo Debar itself, the city, it means uh, no word, no communication, no pasture. It can mean multiple things there. But it's an out-of-the-way place. No communication. No one wanted to go there. It didn't get any communication. There was no pasture land. There was nothing that was good there. There was no one that wanted to be there because it wasn't a successful town. And yet here, Mephibosheth is the, the name of Jonathan's son. He's out and he's hiding and he's crippled. And I can only imagine that he's scared for his life. And then he finds one day that as he's sitting in his house, he hears a knock on the door, and I can imagine that there are two soldiers that are standing there with their armory, and they're saying, the king wants to see you. Now, I don't know about you, but if you knew who you were, that you were of Saul's family, and that there were soldiers from the king's palace who were there to take you to the palace, there would be a little bit of fear that would grip your life. I'm sure Mephibosheth thought in his own heart and his own mind, I'm done for. It's over. My life is done. And so he's crippled and somehow the soldiers either carry him or someone puts him on a donkey and he's led back to Jerusalem, knowing probably that this is the end of his days. He's crippled. He's a son of the former king, uh, a grandson of the former king, and here he finds himself in a challenging situation. He arrives at the palace, and David looks at him. And I can only imagine as David looks at him, he begins to see similar features. He looks a little bit like Jonathan. I recognize the glimmer in his eye. And I can imagine that David begins to sense and to relive all of these wonderful emotions of the friendship that was forged over many years as they began to think through all the wonderful times that he had with Jonathan. And as he looks at Mephibosheth, who's lame in both feet, David looks him square in the eye and he says, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 
It's so powerful because oftentimes in Scripture, this is the word or the phrase that God uses to his people when they're overwhelmed and overcome. Don't be afraid. And David here is almost like God in a sense, and he's saying to Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. You're going to sit at my table. You're going to eat with me. I'm going to invite you to come into the palace. I'm going to give you all the lands that your father had and that your grandfather had. I'm going to give you your servants back. You're going to live off the fat of the land, and you're going to be my guest until the end of your days. Can you imagine this? Mephibosheth now, who is lame in both feet because of an accident that happened when he was very young. Some scholars say that maybe he was five years old. And he responds to the king and he says this, what would my lord the king do with a dead dog like me? Why would you treat me this way? And Jonathan is in the back of David's mind. And David says this, I made a covenant with your dad. And then all the pieces begin to be put into place. That a covenant bond is so very strong. Do you know that for each one of you that have given your lives to Jesus Christ, that you've entered into a covenant bond with Jesus Christ? Do you know that whether you're lame in both feet, no matter what you've done in the past, no matter what sin you've committed, no matter how egregious it may be, that God looks at you, he doesn't care where you've been from, where you've come from, what city you've lived in, low to bar you've been hiding out or whatever, but God comes to you and he sends his warriors to your house to knock on your door and says, don't be afraid. I've come to let you live in my house forever. There's a covenant that we make with God when we give our hearts to him no matter where we've been and what we've done, no matter how crippled we are. If we commit our lives to him and trust in Jesus Christ, if we give our lives fully to him, we're going to feast forever at God's banqueting table. It's a beautiful picture. And David has this question that I think each one of us as believers should ask. How can I be kind? And to whom can I be kind? It's an important question. You see, David was intentional with his reach. You see, Saul was the enemy, so to speak, but David looked beyond that status, and with intention, he said, I want to do something kind. And I've got this phrase here that I want you to kind of read through with me, if they can put that behind me. It says, David's kindness, or his kindness, sprung out of a relationship, and his relationship brought further kindness. So David's kindness sprung out of a relationship with Jonathan, and his relationship with Jonathan and now with Mephibosheth brought further kindness, greater kindness. What does David desire to do? He wants to show love and goodness and charity and compassion. He was intentional. He looked with intentionality. You see, he was kind because of the covenant now, for those of you that have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're in covenant with Jesus. But it, it goes beyond that. It's deeper than that. It's richer than that. Jesus put it this way at the Last Supper, where he was just about to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. Jesus said this, and I don't want you to miss this. Jesus says, a new command I give you. That you should love one another even as I loved you. And then Jesus does something significant. He takes the bread and he takes the cup. And he takes the cup and he says this. A new covenant I make with you with my blood. So there's a command and there's a covenant that God gives to each one of us. And we don't just enter into it with God alone. 
we enter into it with each other. And this is significant because the world will know that we're his disciples by the love that we show for one another. You see, you're not called just to love God. You're not called just to lead an isolated life. And you're not just called, dare I even say, to just go tell the good news to those that don't know. You're called, most importantly, to love one another because it's by loving one another that the world will know that you're his disciples. This is really critical, and we can't miss this, as we talk about this idea of reaching in. You see, David was intentional with his reach in. He said, how can I show kindness? What can I do to show kindness to Saul's family? And for us as believers, we should have this intention in our heart. How can I show kindness to those that I'm in covenant with? How can I show kindness, love, charity with those that are a part of what we call the household of faith. This is a command from Jesus himself because the world will know that we're his disciples. So I was thinking about this. Well, well what is kindness? It's, it's love in action. And I was thinking about all the different people in this church that display kindness in little ways. I was thinking about a lady by the name of Thelma who goes to church sits over in this section right over there, and almost every Sunday, without fail, she has Tootsie Rolls in one hand and has gum in the other hand. And with a twinkle in her eye, she hands out all these Tootsie Rolls to all these kids. And I know because I have twin boys. And they come home with Tootsie Rolls and gum. And I'm thinking to myself, you see, that's kindness. It's love in action. You see, Jesus said this. He said that uh, we should so love one another that we should lay down our lives for one another. And oftentimes when we hear that as Christians, we're a little bit overwhelmed. Oh, my gosh, how could I, how could I die for someone? And I would say this, if we can be kind to each other in the little things, we'll be kind to each other in the big things. If we can love each other in the little ways, we'll be able to lay our lives down when it really matters. I think about uh, another um, gentleman in our church, and he likes to uh, give away coins. He's a coin collector. He usually sits over in this section, right over there. And uh, I know because I've seen him pass out coins to people. And as he's giving these coins, he has a huge smile on his face. You see, it's his way of connecting with people on just a small scale. And I was thinking about both of these individuals who, in little ways, they go out of their way to build somebody up to lift them up, to make them feel like the person that they're talking to is the most important person in the world. And I think it's a lesson for each one of us that we need to be those in the little seasons and moments of life that as we come into people's uh, situations and circumstances, when we interact with them uh, here in the sanctuary or out in the halls or at lunch or whatever, that we're able to fully listen and to fully engage. And as we do that, those little acts of kindness will go a long way in displaying the love that we have for one another. The first century Christians were horribly persecuted. They were scattered all across the Roman Empire. And of course, we know the history and the fate of all of the apostles and disciples. They were all martyred for their faith, except for John, who lived well into his 90s. But all of them, without fail, were persecuted, were martyred for their faith. And this was across the globe as they began to be scattered throughout the Roman Empire. The thing that allowed Christianity to grow, and I study this all week, it's, it's fascinating. Historians marvel over how Christianity overtook the Roman Empire, especially with such persecution. How? Why did it happen? They study this 
with minds and questionings and wondering how could this little insignificant out of the way preacher from Galilee topple the Roman Empire in less than three centuries. It's because of the love of Jesus Christ that pours through disciples. There were several plagues that hit the Roman Empire in the three centuries before Christianity took over the Roman Empire. And in both of these plagues, historians say that as many as 5,000 people a day were dying. So much so that whole cities were abandoned. The Romans were so overcome and the priests of the false gods would lift their hands and not know what to do. Family members who were so horrified and filled with fear as all of this began to creep from one house to another, they would literally take the bodies of their family members who weren't even dead yet and throw them out onto the streets because they were so fearful that they themselves would die. But the Christians were so different. One of the bishops in one of the cities said this, we rejoice when the plague hit because it demonstrated to the world two things. We were not afraid to die. And two, we displayed love and kindness when no one understood it. They would tend to the wounded and care for those who were sick. And they themselves weren't immune to the plague. God didn't give them some kind of special protection. Many of them died as well. But the Romans were so overcome by the love and the kindness of these Christians that it began to multiply. You see, these little deeds of kindness, of tending to and caring for these individuals so changed the course of the psyche of the empire that it ended up toppling the Roman Empire so much so that it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. You see, deeds of kindness done in a little way will create massive change. And church, I want to say this, that your deeds of kindness, of love, no matter how small, no matter how little, will affect great change. And so I want to leave you with this today. I want to issue a challenge to you as a church that you be kind to those here in this church. That you be kind to those that maybe are seated right next to you. So then you ask, well, how can I be kind and how do I do that? Well, I want to, I want to have you do this. I want you to find three people this week that are believers that are maybe right here in this sanctuary today, that are believers that you can reach into. In other words, that you can be kind. Or it might be taking them out to lunch. It may be meeting somebody new for the first time. Maybe it's a poor college student and you uh, give them a gift card. Or maybe it's something where you write a little note of encouragement or thanks or whatever. But you make them the most important person on the planet. You lift them up and encourage them. I want to read a verse out of Hebrews, which I think is just so, so important. It says this in Hebrews 10. In response to all that he has done for us, let us outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other and in doing good. Let me read that again. Let us outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other and in doing good. In other words, practice being good to each other. Practice being kind to each other. Because, why do we do this? Because we're in covenant relationship with God and we're in covenant relationship with each other. This is the question that David asked, who can I be kind to? And then he went and did it. And I would pray that would be the same for you, that you would be kind, that you would take the opportunity to be kind to those that are around you. Now, we have a couple of opportunities today, immediately after the service. Pastor Don is having an informational meeting for those that minister to the homebound, those that can't get out and come to church because of the physical illness that they have. We have numbers of people in our church 
who have come and have been part of this church for decades, and now they find themselves in the latter years of their life. And we as a church, we want to be kind to them. We want to visit them and tend to them and care for them. And so Pastor Don has a group of people that, that already go right now and go from house to house, and we'll train you and help you. But that's one practical way that you can be kind and walk in that demonstration of kindness. And there are other ways that you can do that. I think about there's a, a, a women's conference, the IF conference. Man, I want to challenge you to go to this conference. Ladies, if you're here and you're listening to me today, go to the conference. It's this Friday and Saturday. Bring somebody with you. Encourage them. Maybe pay for them or buy their meal or whatever it is. But I want to encourage you that as a church that we be kind to each other. We love each other. We reach in because as we do, the world will know that we're his disciples. Amen. Would you join with me in prayer? Father, I pray that we would do the little things of kindness so that we'll be able to lay down our lives in love. I thank you for this wonderful, amazing church that so loves you and so loves the world. God, would you continue to pour out your Holy Spirit in the lives of those that are here today. Just as you keep your eyes closed and your head bowed, there may be some of you here today that, that are struggling. Maybe you feel like you're Mephibosheth. You're lame in both of your feet and, and you're just in a place that's really no good. Today I want to pray for you just right where you are. I want to bring encouragement into your life. If that's you, just lift your hand. I want to pray for you right where you are. If you're feeling maybe, man, I'm in a place of discouragement. Lord, you see these hands that are lifted up today. God, I pray that you would bring encouragement. That you would lift them up. Lord, that you would bring them from a, a place of no good. And then you would transplant them into your palace, into your kingdom. May they sense your strength, and feel your presence. God, I pray, bless them. Bless them in the name of Jesus. And Lord, while we're praying, God, I, I pray for George Arnold, Lord, as he just lost his wife of a number of years. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would rest upon him and that you would comfort him. The power of the Holy Spirit would rest upon him, Lord, over the next, Lord, several days, Lord, as he goes through the grieving process, Lord, over the next months, Lord, be with him. Use us as a church to surround him and encourage him. Lord, I pray also for the Pettit family, Lord, thinking about Susan who lost her husband as well. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, would you comfort her and encourage her and bless her. Lord, may she sense the love and encouragement of this church Lord, as we come alongside her and encourage her. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that brings comfort into each one of our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you could stand with me this morning. If you need prayer, we want to pray for you. If you have any need of physical healing, we believe that God heals today. He wants to touch you. Uh, I'll have our prayer team come forward if there's anyone else that... uh, needs prayer, please come forward at this time. If you can lift your hands up, uh, I'll bless you as is our tradition here at this church. Uh, Father, I pray that you would bless each one here, that they would love you and walk with you all the days of their life. Bless them this week to be kind in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you.